I'd like to talk today about endocrine emergencies in the primary care clinic, and um, I have no conflicts of interest or financial disclosures. So I know a lot of you might be thinking, wait, what endocrine emergencies? Because most of the time when you refer patients to us, our usual suggestion is, come back, we'll see if you've grown. And uh, you know, endocrinologists are sort of ponderous kind of people, and we like to sit and think about our pathways. But um, I'm here today because there are a few situations where maybe we do have to think a little more quickly, and there are situations that require urgent attention to prevent decompensation, cognitive delay, um, and other sort of dire consequences. So I'd like to tell you today uh, four stories um, that have actually happened and that we've all seen in our practice over the last several months since this winter and that sort of illustrate some of the barriers that we've had in uh, the provider, the PCP provider, um, endocrinologist relationship, and ways that I think that we could have made this, these situations a little bit better, um, both from our end and the end of the pediatrician. My objectives through this talk are to help you to recognize the urgency of newborn screening results for hypothyroidism and congenital adrenal hyperplasia, to act appropriately on those newborn screening results, sometimes it's not always obvious what to do, to recognize the presentation of adrenal insufficiency in the clinic, and to recognize and refer new onset type 1 diabetes. Some of this may be pretty basic information for many of you, but unfortunately what we've seen is a number of misdiagnoses lately, and so I'm hoping that while this is preaching to the choir, you get a little bit of new information as well. So our first story is a tale of TSH. So the on-call physician receives a call about a newborn screening result that shows a low T4 and an elevated TSH. So the infant is eight days old. He was, um, he's 2.8 kilograms and he has a TSH of 250. So what's the next step? Just think about that. So I'll tell you what actually happened. The family was asked to return to the office and a repeat newborn screen was sent. Since the free T4 was found to be detectable, the child was sent home pending the results of the repeat newborn screen. Two weeks later, the office received another call from the state laboratory, and the TSH was now 412, and this just occurred in Maryland a couple months ago. So obviously, we're dealing with a case of congenital hypothyroidism, uh, which has a U.S. incidence of about 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 3,500. It's the most common cause of preventable mental disability worldwide. And I think it's important to remember that and to tell patients about that when you see them because many times they don't understand the urgency of treating hypothyroidism. This is a picture of a baby with very classic hypothyroidism, um, what we used to call cretinism, with very coarse facial, facial features, some edema that you can sort of see in the face as well as in the scrotum, and an umbilical hernia. We really don't want kids to get to that point. So just um, quickly to talk about a little bit about the development of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, everything really happens in those first 10 weeks in terms of organogenesis and migration of the thyroid down the neck to where it's supposed to settle. Processes in that can all go wrong at any point, and it's amazing that they actually don't go wrong more often than they do. And then maternal thyroid hormone is actually very important for that process. So it's not fetal thyroid hormone that regulates most of that. Maternal thyroid hormone also is important for the maturation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis and then the development of more subtle um, parts of the hypothalamic pituitary axis later. And so it's really only after birth that you would detect problems such as hypothyroidism in the neonate. Most of the time, congenital hypothyroidism is due to thyroid dysgenesis. So if a family asks you, what's going on here? Most of the time, it's because the child has an ectopic thyroid gland, a dysgenetic or hypoplastic thyroid gland, or complete agenesis of the thyroid gland. And we treat all of those etiologies the same. Dishormonogenesis can also occur. Generally, in those cases, you would actually see a goiter. And I know any of, some of you in the audience have actually seen that and called us. And so that's generally alarming enough that um, you notice it. It generally occurs about 10 to 15 percent of the time and is due to problems in organification of thyroid hormone and can also be due to some rare syndromes that are also associated with deafness. Central hypothyroidism that we sometimes think about is a very rare cause of congenital hypothyroidism. And then, of course, there are other transient causes. Um, and the most important among those are prematurity, um, maternal thyroid antibodies, and, of course, we can't forget diagnostic lab error. So does anyone know what this is? Let's talk on thyroid. So, 
Yeah, I see people vaguely pointing to their throats. So I'll show you this with the arrow sign. It's the lingual thyroid. And sometimes you can see this in an older child. Um, and it's kind of fun to see this thing sort of pulsating in the back of the neck. Um, very difficult to see in a baby unless he or she is sort of screaming loudly. So why do we do newborn screening for congenital hypothyroidism? It's really because 78% of infants with congenital hypothyroidism treated prior to three months of age, but none of those treated after six months of age had an IQ of over 85. Um, so we think of this as every day untreated, our IQ points lost. And that's why we are so um, sort of pushy about getting these newborn screen results, making sure that ch children get treated early because of how important thyroid hormone is for cognitive development. Uh, in most states, we do a primary T4 with a backup TSH for T4 levels that are low. That's what's done in Maryland and Virginia. The District of Columbia is among the few that still just does a primary TSH. So why does that matter? So obviously both of those are going to pick up most cases of primary congenital hypothyroidism. So cases due to what I talked about earlier, thyroid agenesis, thyroid dysgenesis, ectopic thyroid, so anything that really is kind of the most common causes of hypothyroidism. If you only do a primary T4, you will, and, and with a follow-up TSH, you might pick up some central hypothyroidism. You're certainly not going to pick it up if you only check a TSH. Mild congenital hypothyroidism is very difficult to pick up when you're just looking at T4 levels because they're often normal, but will be picked up by a TSH that might be slightly elevated. There is a phenomenon called delayed rise TSH, which is really not picked up well when you're only measuring a TSH because obviously it won't be delayed yet. And finally, there are newer genetic syndromes that can cause hypothyroidism, and neither of those will be, none of those will be picked up by either type of screening. And I point this out only to make sure you know that if you're thinking about congenital hypothyroidism in a child, just because the newborn screen is negative does not necessarily mean it's ruled out. So it's still important to look at. So what do you do with these abnormal newborn screening results? Any infant with a low T4 level and a TSH over 40 is considered to have primary hypothyroidism until proven otherwise. I think that's the major take-home message for this. That child requires urgent examination and confirmatory serum tests. So while you can send a repeat newborn screen, it's important not to only send a repeat newborn screen. And we always suggest initiating levothyroxine replacement prior to receiving any confirmatory results. For lower TSH elevations, so those under 40, especially in premature infants, we can consider a repeat newborn screen. Um, there's less risk of cognitive effects. So how do we treat this? I'm focusing on treatment, not so much because you will probably be the one prescribing the levothyroxine, but because as the primary care physician, you're most likely the one seeing the patient on a very regular basis, and it's really only um, as a team together that we can make sure that the patient is compliant with the medication, that the parents get all their questions answered about the medications, and that they really understand the importance of why they should even be on it. Um, there are a few key differences in the treatment of babies with hypothyroidism compared to adults and older children, and I just want to go over those so that we're all on the same page. Levothyroxine is generally initiated at a much higher weight-based dosing than, the, than we would do in an older child, so we generally give 10 to 15 micrograms per kilogram per day. The TSH can take a while to normalize, so it's important to sort of weight that out. And we want to avoid prolonged hyperthyroidism with overtreatment. That can cause a very jittery, unhappy baby, and it can also advance bone age, which is not generally considered to be a good thing. Uh, the tablet's generally crushed or administered with water or formula, and this is contrary to some of the pharmacy labels that patients will see on the bottle of the levothyroxine that says, do not administer with milk. Um, obviously, that's a little difficult to do in a breastfeeding baby, since all they're drinking is milk. Uh, and for our parents, we always tell them that consistency matters a lot more than the timing with feeding. A lot of them come back to us so worried because they've seen the label on the levothyroxine bottle that says, take no closer than four hours from food. How on earth is a two-month-old supposed to do that? And so they're very worried. They're starving their children for four hours, and then they're giving their medication. So what we tell people is, just be consistent. Take it at the same time every day, and everything will work out fine. If it turns out they have slightly decreased absorption, we end up going up on the dose a little bit. 
There are some substances that do interfere with thyroid hormone absorption, and those include soy, iron, and fiber. In particular, some of our children who are on soy-based formulas end up using higher doses of levothyroxine. Iron, also we ask that we separate iron supplementation from levothyroxine replacement by about 12 hours. So it usually means a difference between night and day dosing. There are no reliable liquid preparations out there, despite what pharmacies will tell you about their ability to compound. You cannot compound levothyroxine, so it must be given in tablet form. Monitoring is initially fairly frequent, with initial testing every three to four weeks. Every one to two months, up to age six months, because of um, such rapid growth. And then every three to four months, up to age three years. That's really our critical period for ensuring good cognitive, and especially speech development. So back to our story of this little boy with a, t a, little, uh, boy with a TSH of uh, 250. And remember that two weeks later, the office has now received a call about a TSH of 412. So that's not good. And I think everyone in this audience would recognize that. So how could it have gone better? Instead, let's say this patient had seen you. You ask the child to return to the office, and you send a serum free T4 and a TSH. You place a call to us. And the endocrinologist advises you to start 37.5 micrograms of levothyroxine and schedules a visit with us in two days. Hooray! IQ points saved, and all is well. <laughs> My second story is of a little baby boy, and we'll call him having salt down the drain. So in this scenario, the office receives a call from the state newborn screening lab about a child with a positive 17-hydroxyprogesterone screen. Just for kicks, we'll make this 5 p.m. on a Friday. Um, this is a now seven-day-old boy seen by the PCP at day of life two. Full term, eight pound, three ounce, birth weight, uncomplicated prenatal history. The child has a healthy three-year-old sister and there's no family history of any adrenal disorders. So what would you do next? We don't have the audience response system, but would you repeat the newborn screen? Or since the genitalia weren't ambiguous, we don't have to worry because it's probably a false positive. Send a serum 17 OHP or send a serum sodium to check for salt wasting. Any thoughts? Yeah, so I hear lots of C's and D's. That's probably the best thing to do. So how it actually went, the baby was seen in the office and a repeat newborn screen was sent. The child looked well and had normal genitalia, had not yet regained to birth weight, and the family was sent home pending repeat newborn screening results. Unfortunately, this infant presented to the emergency department the following week in salt wasting crisis. So I know you all were dying to see this slide, adrenal steroid biosynthesis, and I'm sure it's just review for most of you. Um, so the whole biosynthetic pathway in the adrenal cortex is really driven by ACTH, which comes from the pituitary gland. Um, cholesterol is basically driven to produce aldosterone, which is a mineralocorticoid, important for salt balance. Cortisol, important for our stress response and maintaining blood pressure. And testosterone, which then gets converted into estradiol, which is obviously important for sexual differentiation as well as for pubertal initiation. So where's the, the block here? The block is in um, uh, CYP21, which is the 21-hydroxylase enzyme. And so why do we get the results that we get on the newborn screen? 17-hydroxyprogesterone is it, it, it builds up because it can't, can't proceed through the pathway to make cortisol, and that's what we measure. That's the most sensitive indicator of whether or not we have congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And as you can see, the pathway then gets diverted. It's like a blocked pipe, um, sort of like all those drains that we have on Seven Locks Road. Um, it gets diverted, and testosterone increases. And similarly, aldosterone and cortisol decrease. So you really don't have any of these critical hormones that are important for salt regulation and maintaining blood pressure. And at the same time, you have a huge rise in androgen levels. So 21-hydroxylase deficiency actually accounts for 90% of all CAH. It's autosomal recessive. And the classic form, we think of um, classic form as salt wasting or simple virilizing, and I'll tell you about the difference between those, has an incidence of 1 in 15,000. And the non-classic form has an incidence of 1 in 1,500 and generally presents in older children and adults and is not caught by the newborn screen. 
The salt losing form accounts for 75% of classic CAH. Cortisol and aldosterone synthesis are impaired, as I just showed you. And this generally presents with salt wasting crisis in the first two weeks of life with hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypoglycemia, and acidosis. And so this is why we do the newborn screen, to save those children from presenting in salt wasting crisis. The simple virilizing form, those children actually have some glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid reserve. Um, and girls may just be diagnosed at birth with ambiguous genitalia, as they may be in both cases. But boys can actually just present later with signs of precocious puberty because they've had enough reserve to get them through until that point. So what if our infant had been a girl? We just need to talk about that briefly. Most likely, she would have had ambiguous genitalia because she would have been exposed to high levels of androgen since the first trimester. And CAH is actually the most common cause of fetal virilization. Um, and so if you look here, this is a picture of a very virilized female infant. She has fusion of the what we would call labioscrotal folds, and she has clitoromegaly. Um, and this is another baby with even further uh, virilization. Again, fusion here, um, very prominent labial folds and um, very massive clitoromegaly. There would be no palpable testes here, and that's how you would really be able to tell that you were dealing with a female infant. And just to remind you, um, these are the prodder stages of female genital virilization, and they go all the way from a normal female infant who's really had minimal to no androgen exposure to that of a, what looks like a normal male infant, although you wouldn't be able to palpate testes. And so the important thing to remember here is it doesn't go much further than this. You, you, you might have a slight, slightly more robust-looking genitalia, but who in the newborn nursery is really looking for that? So the males really have no overt signs at birth. So they have a much greater incidence of adrenal crisis and are really the reason that we instituted a newborn screen for CAH, which is now mandatory in all states. So let's see if we can think of another ending for this story. The baby is seen in the office and serum 17-hydroxyprogesterone and electrolytes are sent. You call the endocrinologist who asks you to send the patient to the emergency department and the patient is then admitted and started on glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement following stress doses if they were necessary. Our third story is of a, a young man who is tanned and tired. This also just occurred recently. This is a 15-year-old boy who's previously healthy, and he presents to an urgent care clinic. He's had a two-week history of feeling very tired, and his mother is just unable to drag him out of bed in the morning. He's had a one-week history of nausea, a two-day history of several episodes of emesis and poor appetite, and he's thirsty and only wants to eat chips and pickles. When asked about weight loss, he says he's had to wear a belt for the past month. So there's actually a maternal history of vitiligo, and on exam he's afebrile, but he's hypotensive and tachycardic. He's had a 10 kilogram weight loss, and he's moderately dehydrated and does have some abdominal tenderness. His labs, as you can see there, are abnormal. He has hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, acidosis, and hypoglycemia. And so he's sent to the nearest emergency room, rehydrated with normal saline, and sent home. Two days later, he follows up with his primary physician, we'll say that's you, who notices that he looks like he's been in the sun, but it's mid-January, and he's not had any trips to the tropics. So really, all this constellation of signs and symptoms put together are fatigue, weight loss, emesis, signs of volume loss, all these electrolyte imbalances. At that point, as the astute pediatrician, you would probably send a cortisol level, but it would be pending, so you would call endocrinology, um, and get back eventually an inappropriately low cortisol in the setting of all of this metabolic disturbance. So your working diagnosis at that point is adrenal insufficiency. So back to our pathway, because I just can't resist showing this to you. Um, where's the defect in this case? In this case, it's the entire autoimmune destruction of the entire adrenal cortex. And so what happens is aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone production are all down. ACTH levels dramatically rise because of feedback. So primary adrenal insufficiency is actually defined by an elevated ACTH in the setting of low cortisol. There's a low cortisol response to ACTH stimulation, and there's evidence of mineralocorticoid deficiency, as we've said. So this is not a dehydrated kid with normal electrolytes, but rather clear electrolyte imbalance. And there's also hyperpigmentation, and that occurs because there's a prohormone that contains both ACTH and melanocyte-stimulating hormone that's secreted in high amounts. And so you get um, hyperpigmentation in areas generally that are not exposed to the sun, such as the palmar creases and the rest of the palmar aspect of the hand. So when should you think about adrenal crisis in the clinic? 
Any patient with known disorders of adrenal insufficiency, like CAH that we talked about earlier, especially if that child's been exposed to stress or illness and has not taken their stress doses, um, this accounts for about 75% of cases of primary adrenal insufficiency. Patients with evidence of mineralocorticoid deficiency plus hyperpigmentation or vitiligo, vitiligo suggestive of autoimmune disease, that accounts for about 15% of cases. Patients who are on or withdrawing from chronic treatment for corticosteroids, such as patients from the rheumatology clinic, especially if exposed to stress. And finally, patients with other autoimmune endocrine deficiencies like type 1 diabetes, hypothyroidism, or gonadal failure, if you sort of put all that together, you might be thinking about some rare forms of, of um, autoimmune polyglandular syndromes. So how do you manage this? If you really suspect an adrenal crisis, the right thing to do is to administer empiric treatment with stress doses of corticosteroids. And we are always ready to help with that on an emergent basis. So please call endocrinology. Baseline blood testing includes electrolytes, glucose, cortisol, ACTH, obviously, to confirm this diagnosis, and a plasma renin activity, recognizing that you probably won't get all of these lab results back before you're actually ready to treat. So you should not delay treatment pending these results. So let's go back to our story of our young man who clearly has all these metabolic disturbances and endocrinology is consulted. Later you get back a cortisol of less than one, the ACTH is pending, and the endocrinologist advises 100 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone times one dose, and then the patient's admitted to the local hospital for rehydration and started on maintenance glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid. So a week later you get the ACTH level back and that is high. These cases are very rarely subtle. Um, it, this confirms a diagnosis of primary adrenal insufficiency, and a month later in clinic, this young man has gained seven kilograms. His energy level is back to baseline. He feels fantastic. It's really amazing what steroids can do. And our final story is of a little girl with an unquenchable thirst. So this is a nine-year-old girl who presented to clinic about three months ago uh, because her parents are worried that she seems to be losing weight. She's always thirsty, two episodes of nocturia in the past three weeks, and her exam reveals a seven-kilogram weight loss since her well check two months prior. So the um, <clears throat> physician in the clinic that day sends blood work, glucose, insulin, OGTT to an outside laboratory, and the patient and family are sent home. One week later, the provider receives that lab report, and on there is a fasting blood glucose of 342. The lab report is faxed to the endocrinology office, and our poor on-call endocrinologist picks up the fax after rounds. You can imagine how he felt, and if you know our uh, department, you know who he is. <laughs> um, story f for what actually happened, uh, the family is asked to come to the emergency department right away, child is fatigued, has increased polyuria, and is breathing heavily. Um, it turns out that though the mom is not involved in care, the, there is a maternal history of type 1 diabetes that was actually diagnosed in adulthood. And the blood glucose is now 617, sodium is low, pH is clearly low, bicarbonate is 15, and the A1C is 10.1%. So this is no longer just a diagnosis of new onset type 1 diabetes, this is type 1 diabetes plus ketoacidosis. So um, type 1 diabetes is caused by autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells, and its incidence for some reasons that we are not entirely clear about is rising throughout the world, especially in children under 10 years of age. And the U.S. incidence is about 15 to 17 per 100,000 children. And I think it's important to talk about genetic susceptibility for just a minute. Um, the baseline risk to children is 0.4% uh, when they have no family history of type 1, but being an offspring of an affected mother or father, especially of an affected father, um, really uh, bumps up that risk to 2 to 8%. And non-twin siblings of affected patients um, have a risk of about 5%. This is often a question that we get. The clinical presentation includes classic new onset, so polyuria, once the blood glucose has reached um, greater than the renal threshold, polydipsia and weight loss. Diabetic ketoacidosis can occur in about 15 to 20% of patients. And silent or asymptomatic incidental discovery occurs primarily when there's a, a child who's being monitored very closely because of an affected family member. There are caveats to that cl classic presentation, and they include very vague complaints of weight loss or lethargy. It might be very difficult to actually elicit a history of polyuria or polydipsia, and you might only get it with very careful history taking. So nocturia, leaking diapers or heavy diapers, persistent thirst. Um, and in toddlers and girls, you might see perineal candidiasis as one of the presenting signs. 
So the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes is actually defined by a fasting plasma glucose of greater than 126, a random or what we call casual plasma glucose of greater than 200 with signs and symptoms. And it's just important to note that, I know I'm pe preaching to the choir here, but hyperglycemia with polyuria and polydipsia is diabetes until proven otherwise. So what should have happened in our nine-year-old with nocturia, who was always thirsty with weight loss? In your office, I'm hopeful that we could have done a urine dipstick and gotten um, urine glycosuria, and hopefully at that point, negative ketones. An office blood glucose test might have showed us that the blood glucose was greater than 400. At that point, you've appropriately recognized the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, and it's only at that point that you call the endocrinologist, and then we can actually ad initiate admission for ins insulin ad initiation and diabetes education, and hopefully avert DKA. So I hope you've learned a little bit from our four stories, and I've used them to sort of illustrate some of the cases that we've seen recently where I think we all as a group could have worked a little bit better to uh, co-manage our patients really in their best interest. And my take-home points for you are to follow up on newborn screens, ASAP, and we're always ready to help with that. Protect the neonatal brain from hypothyroidism. Males with CAH in particular before diagnosis are at very high risk for adrenal crisis. And please don't delay seeking endocrinology help. Um, some of us may growl, but we're not very mean. Um, adrenal insufficiency is rare, but it can be deadly, and electrolyte imbalances really shouldn't be ignored. Um, steroids can actually save lives. And if you suspect type 1 diabetes, obtaining an immediate confirmation and calling endocrinology is really the appropriate thing to do. And I'd like to just give you the final take-home point that patients with endocrine emergencies do not look like they're in acute distress. They don't look like they're acutely decompensating, but they really could be soon without quick thinking and appropriate co-management. So I thank you all for your attention. And, so, and I'm open to taking any questions. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Nanda Gopal for a great presentation. We actually have about uh, three or four minutes for quick questions, and she's available for consultation in the hallway outside. And, uh, and don't forget our meet and greet reception at 5 o'clock. Questions? We well, actually, actually have... Actually, it's a comment. Okay. So you mentioned about adrenal insufficiency, and you mentioned about congenital adrenal um, hyperplasia. But we had a case a week ago, two weeks ago maybe, of a child who was seven, who was taking um, inhaled corticosteroids and did not take oral, uh, maybe a year ago, but uh, didn't take oral for a long time, and was taking it with, uh, as an Advair product. That's okay. a combination. Great. And I don't know if anybody realizes, but there's no dosage um, put out. In fact, it's not even approved for young kids, even though it's used. So any young child, that means younger than 10, that's taking over 400 micrograms of especially fluticasone, uh, the most potent of the inhaled corticosteroids, a day, uh, over time, and especially during stress, hot weather, dehydration, uh, gastroenteritis, whatever, um, may develop uh, signs of uh, adrenal insufficiency. And this child had also a serum cortisol of zero, uh, that's an 8 a.m. serum cortisol, right. but a normal ACTH. So iatrogenic adrenal insufficiency has normal ACTH. Uh, don't be surprised if it's not elevated, because it won't be. There's also no sodium loss, no high potassium, and no hyperpigmentation. But this is something that we'll be seeing more of. Uh, a good literature search uh, took me about a week or two, but there's been almost 100 such cases, most on higher doses, and at least in children 13 that had a dose of 500 micrograms or less, not a high dose. Thank you. Hi, this, I'm Tom Sullivan from Alexandria, Virginia. I just wanted to make a brief comment. I think it's really great that you commented on the newborn screens, and the AMCG has gotten together with the Academy of Pediatrics uh, and if you just go to the website, AMCG, uh, American College of Medical Genetics, they have act sheets. And for those who can't get a hold of you or are out, further out and came in to join us, you can pull down the act sheet. tells you what to do. As you can see from the incidents, nobody knows what to do because they don't, you know, they don't come in the office all the time. So if you have the act sheet, that will tell you.
Thanks. I, <coughs> oops, that's when you're short. Uh, I, I enjoyed your talk. Um, there are, this is an era of global medicine. There are many countries that don't have screening of yes. newborns. Uh, India in particular, I just was there. And uh, I always told my residents, if a newborn, if a post-newborn is constipated, don't treat him on the f or her on the phone. Because you want to see, look at them, he's probably a hypothyroid. So this is something that should be stressed. Constipation in a newborn isn't just something that you treat with prune juice. I also want to mention about your adrenal, uh, adrenal genital syndrome, that I have pictorials of boy, newborn boys with macrogenistosomia. And they, if they don't have that, they frequently have scrot rugated scrotum and pigmented scrotum. I just want to mention. Yes, no, I think those are good points. And I think in a setting where you don't have newborn screening, it'd be important to take into account things like constipation. Um, but here, I think we do have a fairly reliable newborn screening um, protocol. Um, and I'd like to thank the previous questioner who talked about the ACGME um, fact sheets. Those are really helpful. Um, and then the, to the other point about um, CAH, yes, macro... Um, Large genitals in a boy and rugated scrotum are certainly things that are seen, but um, in our age of rapid newborn assessment in the newborn nursery, rapid discharge from the hospital, often that's not something that's seen uh, very frequently or that's actually paid attention to. So I think it's more important not to think about the genitalia in the male, but really think about uh, following up on the newborn screen.